Hey, let's say good morning to Delegate Mike Height, who joins us via telephone from the Capitol. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Robert. And good morning, Bill. Hey, I missed my wing, wingman here, Mike. When are you coming yeah. back to give me cover? <laughs> Bill, I miss being there with you, I tell you. Uh, it, I, I can't wait to get back and get on the show. Yeah. Well, we have uh, not one seat for you, but in your since you've done such great work, we have two seats reserved for you. Whoa, that's big. Whoa. Uh-oh. And one of them's Rob's. <laughs> uh, no, I do not want Rob's seat. I've been looking for some early retirement uh, replacements, so you you were just put on the short list by Mr. Stubblefield. <laughs> well, take me off that list. <laughs> Mr. Height represents the 92nd Delegate District and is serving in his first term in uh, the state capitol. Mike, we are, uh, as, as Bill said, we're getting close to the end here, just a few weeks left. And the big question, of course, is whether or not we'll have a resolution to the competing tax cuts that are out there. On the Metro News webpage today, they show Speaker Hanshaw and the title that said all sides are very close on a tax cut plan. How likely is something to happen before the end of this session? Well, I I think very likely. Um, I, I think we're really close right now. And... The key is that I think everybody down here wants it. All sides want this to happen. So I think there's a, a push to, to find um, some middle ground to make it happen. Mike, uh, last week, uh, a couple of days ago, Senator Manchin was talking with the leadership and the governor, and he was mentioning how much of the uh, surplus was a product of federal dollars over the last three years. Is that in any way going to change the dynamics of the negotiation between the House and the Senate? Uh, no, I don't think so. And it, and I don't think it is a, um, a result of federal dollars as much as he wants to portray it is. Um, I think this is, is because of, um, you know, four or five years now of flatline budgets. Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, the price of, of oil, gas, and, and coal being high and, and getting additional severance money from that. Um, I think it has to do with inflation and the fact that you're getting more in sales tax because everything costs a little bit more. I think there are, are a lot of factors, um, and that federal dollars um, – is probably a, a very minor factor, if any at all. Yeah, w- w- the point that I came away with it was the the uh, increase of federal dollars uh, pike spiked during the COVID years. It had gone up about six ma- uh, six billion dollars per year, uh, and that was more than what the surplus was. Uh, well, that that may be true, but you know. You'll, you'll see in the next couple of years whether or not that, that sure. had anything to do with our, um, in, you know, influx of, of additional money. I, I don't really think it, it did. I, like I said before, I think it has to do with a lot of the other factors and, and the way that um, West Virginia is running its business right now um, and the influx of new business into West Virginia. You have to take that into account as well when you get people off of uh, – off of welfare and off of unemployment and get them back to work. Um, that's also good for West Virginia. Yeah, and to support what you're saying uh, is that I was very impressed with Senator Tarr, uh, pre- budget presentation, who was on the show a couple so weeks ago, and he had taken into account a lot of these variables. So I that gave me a comfort level of feeling that they had uh, taken into account the federal input as well as the state input. And, you, and you'll notice, I mean, this is politics, Bill, you know, that everybody's going to take credit for um, good news uh, as much as they can. So, you know, Senator Manchin's probably taking a little credit for, sure. uh, for federal dollars. What happened with um, uh, uh, Delegate Steele the other day, uh, shutting down the House for a short period of time? <laughs> Uh, my buddy. <laughs> yeah, how is that relationship going, by the way? Um, he still hasn't talked to me, so not very well. Yeah. Um, I would say that was going very well, Mike. Oh, <laughs> Him wow. not talking with you. So. <laughs> going well for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so 
So, you know, and we talked a little bit about this in caucus, and, um, you know, Brandon is very passionate about uh, a lot of different subjects, and this is a bill that I think he's been trying to run now for four or five years, and um, he's, he's come out and said he's not going to run again, so he sees this as a, a last-ditch effort to get this piece of legislation across the finish line. And, you know, was that the way to do it? I, you know, I don't think so. And here's, here's where I stand on it. I, I didn't like um, the way he did it. I didn't like the process. I think, you know, well, we have a process down here, and you sort of need to follow it and, and just or, – or else everybody would be trying to get 2,000 bills onto the floor that way. And what you found out is he just didn't have the votes for this piece of legislation to pass. Now, I voted, I voted against him to bring this piece of legislation directly to the floor out of committee, um, but most likely I, I may have voted for this piece of legislation if it had gone out of committee and come to the floor the normal process. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a libertarian in, in some areas, and um, this just seems like a, a freedom thing. So, uh, you know, me and Mr. Hornby disagree about a lot of things, and this is one of them. Yeah, refresh us, uh, Mike, if you will, what the legislation was. It deals with vaccination and religious positions. Yeah, it had to do with um, religious freedoms, uh, religious, religious exemptions from having to have vaccinations. Um, and I just don't know that I believe we should be forced to inject anything into our bodies at the the command of of government. So you know, I realize they're good for you, but that should be a choice. Um, given the choice, I would uh, pr vaccinate all of my kids. I would vaccinate myself um, for those diseases that we that we know the vaccinations work and have uh, long-term studies on them um, and that they stop the disease that the vaccination is for. Um, and polio is a good example. We know that vaccination, once you get it, you, you won't get polio and you can't, um, you can't transmit polio once you've had that vaccination. But that is not the case with all these vaccinations. Um, and, and COVID is a good example. The flu um, is a good example. You can get those vaccinations. You can still get both of those diseases. You can still transmit both of those diseases. So we should have the, the opportunity to decide whether or not we're going to inject these things into our bodies or not um, and not have the government uh, getting into that business so and Mike, mandating. Mike, to be clear, you are in favor of mandated inoculations for children entering school for things like polio and mumps, measles, mumps, rubella? No, I, I'm not. You're not. A, you're not for mandating it. So, are, no. are you? Are you? If you're not for mandating those vaccinations for children, are you also saying they should be allowed to go to the public schools without those inoculations? Yes, because if if you're smart and you inoculate your children, then all the other children are irrelevant. Do we, are protected. Do we know that for a medical fact? Well, sure, yeah. I, do, mean, I mean, are you guessing, or do you know that for a scientific medical fact? I, I'm, I, I, I am 99% sure that that is a fact. Those, those diseases... If you were 99% <laughs> sure that the plane you were going to get on was going to land, would you still get on it? Yes, I like planes. <laughs> But so you get on the plane, they buy you, you get a ticket, and the ticket says there's a 99% chance that this is going to land. You getting on the plane? Well, yeah, because there's there's always that chance on a plane. My goodness, I don't even know if it's 99%, is it? W welcome back, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you get on a plane, it can crash. I was having a conversation with my wife about this. As you know, she works at the FDA, and we were, we were talking uh -huh. about this polio vaccine and, and such, and and her comment to me was, I don't know that we know if that's true or not, because everybody got the polio vaccine, at least in such high percentages. I think there was um, a, a Hasidic Jewish community in New York, I think it was a few years back, that was not getting inoculated because of religious uh, uh, beliefs, and they had a, an outbreak 
if it wasn't polio, it was something else. Yeah. Similar to what, what do you get vaccinated for? And, but I, I don't know if on a if half the country decides all of a sudden we're not going to get the polio vaccine. Is your vaccine still going to keep you safe from that many people with polio is the question? Well, but the, the group that you're talking about, none of them got vaccinated and they had an outbreak. But the outbreak didn't spread to the ones that were vaccinated. Is that a fact? I don't know. I'm asking. Well, it, well this is your scenario. You tell me. Well, that's why I'm asking you about whether or not you know for sure whether or no, not we, this, is, this would keep you all safe. Right, let's, let's get Mrs. Mario on the phone. We'll settle this right now. <laughs> Yeah, but this is the question I'd like to. I talk to somebody. We get somebody on the show who can answer that question. If, if ninety percent of the country decides it doesn't want the polio vaccine for their children, ten years down the line, what does that look for, like for the ten percent who have the vaccine? Are you still protected from that much infection in the community? It's hypothetical. Would, well, and, and I'm not a scientist, so I really can't answer that question. But my guess is... But shouldn't we have scientists? Shouldn't we have somebody who can answer that question before we vote on this legislation? No. No, you're talking about taking a, a foreign substance and injecting it into your body, and, and the government is mandating that. No, we should not be doing that. Moving on. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about DHHR because the Senate passed uh, 33 to 1, I think the vote was yesterday, and the Senate's going to the d- uh, governor's desk for a signature. What do you like about this new setup for DHHR? What do you not like about it? Because I know you deal with that department a lot in your regular job. Um, I, I think this is a good first step. Um, I'm anxious to see um, how the breakup uh, brings efficiencies to all three of those um, departments that – uh, I think that there were a lot of inefficiencies before because it was too big for one person to manage. Um, there was always a crisis in one area, and that's where their focus would be. And I think now that you have three cabinet-level departments, um, it gives them uh, an opportunity to focus in on each one of those areas a whole lot better. So I think this is a great first step. Um, I'm anxious to see how it works out. There was some other legislation uh, on the floor yesterday um, about IDD waiver uh, that is also uh, good legislation. It, it looks like it's going to pass through the House. I'm anxious to see it get over to the Senate and get approved over there as well. So I see a lot of good things happening happening in the uh, the the health area and um, look forward to seeing them go further mike let me play the devil's advocate and push back on that i think you and i you're good about that (laughs) (laughs) yeah Uh, but you made a key word uh key statement uh getting in someone uh for leadership uh i'm of the opinion that it's not a size problem as much as it is a leadership problem i'm also of the opinion that the state salary structure is not going to permit you to bring in the type of person you need to lead an organization, either the size of the original DHHR or three components. Uh, we need to address the the leadership before anything else, and I'm not sure this is going to do it. Again, I don't think there's going to be enough money to entice the type of leaders we're looking for to run that organization. Well, I, I don't don't necessarily totally disagree with what you're saying, Bill. Um, However, I think a lot of times you can hire within. There are really good people downstream in these areas um, that have a tremendous amount of knowledge in in those individual um, secretarial positions now. So if we can move them up and they can take over just the health or just the human services, uh, or just facilities management. Um, I, I don't disagree with you about the pay issue. You're not going to be able to hire somebody outside to come in for what we pay as a state at those cabinet level um, uh, positions and, and get just the top notch person. You're, you're absolutely right about that. But I think you can promote from downstream and, and get those people that are very, very knowledgeable about those those uh, smaller areas of 
of health and human services. So th that's what I hope happens. Um, but I don't disagree with you. The leadership at, at DHHR has been um, abysmal over the past few years. Um, I'm, I'm glad that Secretary Crouch finally resigned. Um, I, I like Secretary Coben, but he's, he's a temporary fix, and he himself has said he's a temporary fix and doesn't particularly want to, to have this job long term. He's here to help in the transition. So if you have somebody that, you know, their heart's not in it long term, you know, how effective can they be as well? So I, I'm hoping this split gets um, the right people to the right positions and, and things improve. Mike, and I have no reason saying you'll not be right, and, uh, and I think it was important for the legislators to do something, uh, and you did do something. Uh, and again, my, my proposal would have been, would have required a lot more money than what the state historically pays for a particular salary. Well, and you can look at that in, in just about every area of government. That, exactly. Um, a lot more money is it seems to be the answer of a lot of different people and I hear it daily in finance um, people asking for more money and and I agree uh, in some instances that that is uh, the fix um, for some of these areas but um, sometimes you have to push back because uh, there's only so much so much water in the bucket. Yeah, uh, and, and yeah, and everybody coming and say I want more money. That's not what I'm advocating. I'm advocating that we had a major problem with a huge organization, uh, and we're going to have, a, I think, a significant problem with three smaller organizations. We can we can always put somebody in those positions, but you've got to put somebody in there that has the knowledge base, the leadership skills, the vision skills, and generally that combination uh, requires more money than what we, we tend to want to spend. So, so I don't disagree with what you're saying, but when I talked earlier about um, promoting from within, a lot of times I think that those individuals downstream weren't, were not allowed to do the things that they felt were necessary in, in their area um, to make things better. So if, if the leadership at the top was preventing um, or not assisting in a way to make things um, better uh, downstream, then you have to look at the top. And if you get rid of that person at the top and promote the ones who are really the, the ones getting it done, um, sometimes things do improve, and it's not necessarily a money issue. And, and that is my hope, is that we're going to promote from within for those people that really know what's going on in those areas, and, and that will improve uh, the Department of Health and Human Resources. Yeah, along that line, I had a very wise boss who once told me that he hired the best people he could find and then ran like hell trying to stay up with them. And uh, so we, that's what you need to do, find good people. That is, that is, that's, that is a great that's analogy, how, Bill. That's how I select co-hosts around here. <laughs> <laughs> we have a thorough screening process. We put them <laughs> through. Do, yeah. We do. <laughs> Mike Kite, uh, HB 3480, enact the West Virginia Consumer Financial Privacy Act of 2023. Does it have any chance of passing? That's your bill right now. I see it's in judiciary. So I have fought like hell, and I don't know if I can say that on the radio. But I just I did. I just did. So you're okay. Yeah. So I have I have fought like the devil to, to get this um, – this piece of legislation um, on the agenda in, in judicial, and it has finally made it on the very last day um, that it can be passed. So my hope is that it can be. This is very easy legislation, I believe. It is one of those freedom things. It is, um, you know, who the heck could say no to it? And and. To tell you what the legislation does, it just prevents the credit bureaus from selling your financial information uh, without your permission, which is going on right now. Every time you fill out a credit report at the bank, at the mortgage company, um, to get a new credit card, whatever, when you fill out that form and it gets sent to a credit bureau to, to determine what your credit is, um, they take all that information in and, and they are selling it. 
um, and, and making probably lots and lots of money off of it. Um, so you fill out a credit application and next thing you know you're inundated with phone calls and emails and text messages and all kinds of stuff because the credit bureaus have sold your information. And what this piece of legislation does is it stops that. It gives you the opportunity to opt in if you so desire to have all those phone calls and, and stuff. Um, otherwise, you are automatically opted out and that they can't sell your information. So it, that's all this legislation does. I can't see why anybody would be against it. I, am, I, I have worked with uh, judicial counsel. Uh, Moore Capito has been uh, wonderful about helping me get through this, working with his counsel, um, you know, tweaking it here and there um, so that he could bring it uh, to, the, to his agenda in, in uh, judicial. Mike, there's a, a sports analogy that in basketball that you start off uh, as a freshman, but by the time uh, you get to the end of the season, you're no longer a rookie. I assume you feel the same way, Mike, that you're no longer a rookie? Well, I, I, absolutely. Even though I, I still am a rookie, I, I don't feel like one anymore. Um, and that's evidenced by, you know, when I first got here, and we do caucus at 8 o'clock, I would not miss caucus for anything. I mean, I'm a freshman. you got to be in there. you got to hear what's going on, yada, yada, yada. And here today, everybody's in caucus, and I'm talking to you, Bill. <laughs> a, a wise choice, Mike. A wise choice indeed. <laughs> Uh, Mike, in regards to the ability for this is kind of uh, on the list of important things. I'm sure this doesn't really rate, but Berkeley County Council beginning of the session, we were all enthusiastic about it being referred to as a commission once again. Mike Hornby told me that got more convoluted the further along it went, and that it virtually had no chance of passing. Do you know anything about this discussion? You know, I haven't followed that piece of legislation. That was a piece of legislation that I thought. It was a slam dunk. I'm, I'm, I was like, who in the heck is going to vote against this? What does any other delegate or senator care other than Berkeley County? Um, and this is something Berkeley County wants. So it doesn't affect them. It doesn't cost money. Just vote for the darn thing. So I just don't know why it's getting hung up. Hornby mentioned something about the Constitution and whatever. I got an email from a Terry Meisinger who said that all the – Commission, all the council has to do is submit a form, and, uh, and and that moves the process along. I don't know if they've done that. All I know is, from talking to Mike, it doesn't seem like this is going to get passed. Like I said, this is not the most important piece of legislation uh, that is being considered this session, but it seemed like it would have been an easy one to pass. But yeah, what an easy slam dunk. And, and, you know, as far as submitting a form, why? What the hell? We're the legislature. We don't need no damn form. Just, just do it. <laughs> We don't need no stinking form. <laughs> That's right. This is beautiful. Hey, uh, final word is yours, sir. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm just going to say that uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time down here and, and getting to see how the sausage is made, uh, per se. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to, to getting some meaningful legislation done down here um, and, you know, Maybe continue my run. Yeah. Hey, Mike, now you can go back into your caucus and share with them all the words of wisdom you received from Rob this morning. Yeah, they could care less. They don't <laughs> They don't pay attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody pays attention to me either, so we're in the same book. Then. Hey, Mike, have a great day. Hey, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Bill. Thanks Good for job. joining us, Mike.